Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Sake School of America webinar. We're going to give everyone a few minutes to file in. While you're getting settled, uh, right beneath my picture, you should see a button that says chat on it. If you'd like to click on that chat and then select from the drop down all panelists and attendees, I'd love for you to say hello and let me know where you're calling in from today. Please let me know where you're calling in from. We'll see who's the furthest away. Maybe we can get someone from, ah, Fabio, thank you so much. We have someone from Brazil. Fabulous, that's wonderful. Thank you all so much for logging on today. Excellent, this is great. Also, I wanna check in the chat if everyone can see me and hear me all right. Uh, if I'm coming through loud and clear with the sound and video, please let me know in the chat if you can see me and hear me all right. All right, good. Excellent, loud and clear. All right, well, I wanna welcome everyone to our Sake School of America Niigata Prefecture Sake Lecture. We're gonna have a lot of fun today. And before we get started, I wanted to uh, do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, I introduced you to the chat button. So please feel free during the course of the seminar to uh, put your comments in the chat window and be sure to select all panelists and attendees at the bottom. That will make sure that everyone else in the room can see your chat comment as well. Now, if you have a specific sake question for me, there's another button right below my picture called Q&A. And I want you to click on that Q&A button and type in any questions you have in there. If you put all your questions in the chat as it scrolls along, I may miss some of the questions. So if you have a question you want me to answer when we do our Q&A section, please uh, put that in the Q&A box and uh, I'll address that when we get to the Q&A. Wonderful. All right. I think that's good. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. All right, now you should all see my slide and my face. <laughs> I hope you can see both. Uh, this is going to be all about the sake of Niigata. And before we get started, um, I just want to a, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Timothy Sullivan. I'm a sake educator with the Sake School of America. I've been in the world of sake for about 15 years. And I started in sake by blogging on my blog, urbansake.com, which is now a sake education website. A few years ago, I had the great opportunity to move to Japan and work at a brewery for one year. So I have actually worked as a brewer for 12 months. I was at uh, Hakaisan Brewery in Niigata Prefecture. So one of the reasons I'm so excited about tonight is I got the chance to work in the region that we're gonna be profiling tonight. So I did sake brewing there for one whole year. So I'm gonna bring some insight and some photos to the lecture tonight that I hope will be really interesting for you. Now, one thing I hear from my students a lot is that learning about sake regions can be challenging and difficult. And I know when I was first getting into sake, it was very difficult for me to remember the different regions and different prefectures. Um, some people just don't know where to start. When people say that to me, I always have one answer for them. And I always say, Niigata. Niigata is the best place to start. And the reason for that is Niigata is one of the prefectures that has a real, true identity related to sake, a true terroir, I believe. So we're going to spend uh, the hour today talking about Niigata. And I really, when, when you were done with the seminar, I really want you to have a good idea, not only of Niigata geography, but also some aspects of the regional culture that are unique to Niigata. 
And also we're gonna taste through five of the top sakes from the Niigata region. And I'm gonna profile each subregion of Niigata where those breweries are located. And we're gonna taste those sakes together. Now, before we get into talking more about Niigata, I wanna do a quick poll and I wanna see how much experience you guys have with Niigata sake. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. Let me know, can you see the poll? Let me know in the chat if you can see it. No, launch poll. There we go, how about that? All right, so this is a question about how much experience you have tasting Niigata sakes already. Have you ever tried Niigata sake before? Some of you might have your favorite brands and be a real Niigata fan already. Some of you might know a little bit about Niigata. Some of you have probably had sake before, but maybe not sure where it's from. Some might be absolute beginners. So please let me know where you fall on the spectrum as far as how much you're invested in Niigata already for as far as your sake experience goes. All right. So the, all right, so I'm gonna share this. All right. Share results. Okay. So can you all see the results now? The majority have good experience with Niigata and have some favorite sake brands. That's wonderful. And a lot of you have had Niigata sake, but you wanna learn more. So this is absolutely perfect. And for those of you who are absolute beginners out there, don't worry, we're gonna be covering a few minutes of sake basics so you won't be left behind. And we're gonna start uh, right from the beginning so you'll be able to enjoy along with all of us. Okay, so one thing that is really important when we talk about Niigata is to know where Niigata is. So the slide you see here shows you Japan. The black star that's there is where Tokyo is located. And Niigata is on the other side of Honshu Island, the main island of Japan. And you see it highlighted there in pink. To take the bullet train from Tokyo into Niigata takes about uh, just over an hour and 15 minutes or so. So in about an hour, you can get from Tokyo to Niigata. So it's not that far, um, but geographically, the, the, the geographical terrain is quite different from Tokyo, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Now, when people think about Niigata, if you were to ask somebody in Japan, what, what do you think of when you say Niigata? A lot of people are going to think about something like this. So Niigata is known as Yuki Guni. Yuki Guni, that means snow country. And Niigata is really famous in Japan and around the world for the amount of snow that they get. This photo you're seeing here in the slide is actually a photo I took during my time in Niigata. This was a shot in January, and you can see the snow is falling very wet and very heavy. And on either side of the walkway here, it's about five or six feet deep. So this is not uncommon in the winter in Niigata at all. Now, snow is one of the trademarks of the Niigata region. But why is snow so important? Here's another shot. Uh, this is not a photo I took, but I thought it really illustrated how, um, what this, what's this guy doing? He's doing something very dangerous, but they do have people who can come in and remove the snow off your roof um, because it, it can really, really pile up. Uh, and it's just absolutely astounding the volumes of snow that they get in Niigata. Well, why is this snow so important? Why are we gonna be talking about snow so much when we talk about Niigata? Well, uh, the first reason is that the snow is going to give us very clean water. When the snow melts, we get an abundance of super clean, soft mountain spring water. This is not only good for making sake, but also good for growing rice. This light snowmelt water also impacts 
the general taste of sake from the Niigata region. You're gonna get sakes that are lighter, cleaner, generally drier because of this low minerality snow melt water. So how does Niigata get all this snow? Let's take a little look at the geography. So here's Japan and you see Niigata highlighted there in red. To the left of Japan, you see the Sea of Japan, large body of water. And beyond that, we have Korea, China, and Russia. What happens is cold Arctic air comes from Siberia and blows over the Sea of Japan. And as you pass over the Sea of Japan, this air picks up lots of moisture. And the first thing it hits are the mountains of Niigata. So let's zoom in a little bit. And here we've zoomed in on Niigata's geography. You see the cold Arctic winds are coming in from the left. The green circles on this map represent uh, the Echigo mountain range. So these are the highest peaks of the mountain range. And as you can see, they kind of line up almost like a backbone for uh, the edge of Niigata. When the cold winds come in, they hit this mountain range and they dump the snow on the west side, on Niigata Prefecture. And that is why so much moist, cold air coming in, the first thing it hits is the mountains of Niigata, and that creates a target for this region where it's gonna get lots and lots of snow. The stars that you see here, the black stars on this map, represent the locations of the sake breweries that we're gonna be visiting today. So from the north to the south, you can see where they are in relation to the mountains and the Sea of Japan. In addition to that, I found this information about the 10 uh, heavy snowfall locations from 1945 to 2006, the cities that had the deepest snowfall accumulation over the winter season. And if we look at the list, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven out of 10 of the snowiest places in Japan from 1945 to 2006 have been in Niigata Prefecture. So this is another indication of how much the snow impacts uh, the life in Niigata. When we have, this, that, again, that beautiful, clear, clean water, there's a few things that uh, it gives us culturally in Niigata as well. The first one related to sake is go hyaku mangoku. And I know that's kind of a mouthful of a word, but go hyaku mangoku is actually Niigata's native sake rice. So this is a sake rice that was developed and propagated in Japan, and it is the signature sake rice of this region. Generally, this sake rice gives sake a cleaner, lighter air, and uh, this sake rice grows particularly well because of the range of temperatures during the day to the evening. You can have higher temperatures during the day and quite cold temperatures at night. And that change in temperature allows Gohyaku Mangoku to grow quite abundantly and very, very well in the Niigata region. So the majority of the sakes we're tasting tonight uh, along with this seminar, use this gohyaku mangoku sake rice. So I wanted to be sure to mention it right at the beginning. We're going to keep an eye out for this. And this is a picture that I took of gohyaku mangoku growing in uh, Niigata. Uh, the next impact of this super clean water is koshi hikari. So koshi hikari is not a sake rice. This is actually an eating rice but it grows very abundantly in Niigata, and it's some of the most expensive eating rice. It is known as a very high quality. And I think if you ask people about Niigata and they don't say snow, the next thing they would say would probably be rice or koshi hikari. It's extremely well known, and I got very spoiled when I lived in Niigata. I could eat koshi hikari every day, and uh, it, it's a wonderful, very, very delicious sake, sorry, eating rice that grows abundantly in Niigata. There's a few other cultural things I wanted to talk about. Um, one is Nishikoi. So Niigata is also famous for koi fish. I read that there's over 200 koi farmers in Niigata. 
And again, this is a, a result of the super clean water that they have in Niigata. It's an excellent, excellent region for farming koi fish. And I had the opportunity to visit a koi farm when I went to Niigata, and it was absolutely amazing. The number of fish and the variety of colors that they had, and they can sell these fish for tremendous amounts of money. They're collected all over the world. And Niigata is a real hub for this, this subculture of koi fish. And one of my favorite things when I lived in Niigata was uh, we had uh, two really famous fireworks festivals in the summer. Uh, one is Nagaoka, which is uh, rated as the third uh, largest uh, fireworks festival in Japan. I went to that and there were tens of thousands of people. I don't think I've ever been in a crowd that big. And it was absolutely beautiful and amazing. There's another fireworks festival in Niigata, which I also got to go to, uh, Takakai, sorry, Katakai, the Katakai Fireworks Festival. And that festival is famous because they have the largest single firework uh, in the world gets detonated at that festival. Uh, it is a 925 pound ball and they shoot it up in the air and it makes a really, really loud bang. You can uh, Google it on YouTube if you wanna, if you wanna see it but it is absolutely amazing. It's actually in the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest single detonation of fireworks. And that happens uh, in Katakai Festival in Niigata. So let's take a look now a little bit more at the sake culture in, in Niigata. Um, there are more sake breweries in Niigata than any other region in Japan. There's 47 prefectures in Japan and Niigata has about 90 sake breweries, which is the largest number of sake breweries. Now, when you hear that, you may think that uh, maybe Niigata has the largest volume of sake production as well, since they have the most breweries, it would make sense. But actually they don't. There's two other prefectures, Kyoto and Hyogo, that have more volume of production with fewer breweries. So what does that mean for us? Well, that actually means that those uh, other prefectures that make a large volume of sake, they do more mass production. And the breweries in Niigata tend to be a bit smaller in scale and produce smaller batch size. And they produce smaller volumes with more breweries. And actually the difference between Hyogo, which has the largest output, about 100 and 35,000 kiloliters. Uh, Kyoto's next, about 95,000 kiloliters. And Niigata is 39,000 kiloliters. So almost three times as much going out of Hyogo than we have out of Niigata. But Niigata ranks very high in the, uh, the ex sorry, the production of Ginjo style sake. These are considered the premium and super premium grades of sake. So Niigata ranks very, very high in production, only second to Hyogo. So we get a large number of breweries, smaller, more artisanal production, and great emphasis on premium and super premium grades of sake. What other parts of sake culture do we have in Niigata? Well, I think one of the most famous sake festivals is called Sake no Jin. Uh, this obviously did not happen this year because of COVID-19, but this is the largest sake festival in Japan. Um, they get a tremendous amount of people, tens of thousands of people over a weekend. And this is an all-you-can-drink sake festival, absolutely huge. I went there once and I was really overwhelmed with the number of people. And uh, people pay a small entrance fee and they can try sake from all over Niigata. It's a wonderful opportunity if you're interested in learning more about Niigata sake. So if this festival gets back up and running next year and you're in Niigata, uh, please check and see if you can visit Sake no Jin. It's a once in a lifetime experience that I hope you'll get to have. Now I looked up the uh, average sake consumption for Japanese people. And the average consumption per person in Japan 
is about 11 and a half liters per person on average of Japanese sake, what we call Nihonshu. So that's 11 and a half liters per person on average. Uh, in Niigata, if we look at Niigata only, the average per person is 24 liters. So from 11 and a half to 24 liters per person on average. So that means that Niigata is number one for Nihonshu or for sake consumption in Japan. That's the number one prefecture. So more sake is consumed uh, on average in Niigata than anywhere else in Japan. So I think that underscores what a real uh, epicenter Niigata is for sake culture. In addition to the Sake no Jin Festival, there's a few uh, serious educational opportunities. Niigata University has a program called Sakeology. This is a, a college, a university diploma you can get in the study of sake. Uh, they do technical aspects, marketing, uh, agriculture. You can study all aspects of sake production and the University of Niigata put this program together a few years ago. So this is a fairly recent development to promote the uh, growth and the um, encouragement of sake culture in Niigata and in Japan. So I think it's wonderful when higher education promotes the um, growth of sake culture as well. And not only Niigata University, but there is a school called the Niigata Sake School, Seishu Gakko in Japanese. This was founded in 1984 by several sake brewers. And this has the same focus as the sakeology course, but this focuses primarily on sake production. So if you wanna be a toji, you wanna to work at a brewery, and you live in Niigata, this is a wonderful place to go. And this has been around since the early 80s. All right, fantastic. Well, if you have any questions as we're going along, please remember to click on the Q&A button and register your questions in the Q&A section, and I'll be sure to answer them when we get to the Q&A portion uh, towards the end of our lecture today. Now, for those of you who are relatively new to sake, I wanted to take just a couple minutes and do a little bit of a sake 101 to review the basics for you so that everyone has a uh, same foundation when we move on to the tasting portion. So starting our sake 101, we're gonna talk briefly about sake ingredients. And there are generally four sake ingredients we need to know about. Water, yeast, koji, and rice. Let's look at each of these very briefly. So water is um, one of the major ingredients in sake. 80% of what's in a bottle of sake is water. So it has a big impact on the impression and overall texture of the sake. The picture you see here is a Niigata mountain stream water source. So this is a true uh, example of where water would be coming from for Niigata sake. This is actually the water source for the Hakkaisan Brewery. And in general, water, the softer it is, and again, snow melt water in Niigata is gonna be extremely soft, very low minerality. The softer the water is when you uh, brew with that water, the lighter and cleaner the sake can come out. Other parts of Japan may use well water as an example, and that would be much more mineral rich. Uh, that would create more full bodied, heavy sake. So when we talk about this snow melt water, it's a real sense of regionality for the Niigata region. Moving on to the next ingredient, uh, we're gonna look briefly at yeast. So yeast is the microorganism that eats sugar and gives us alcohol. I call this the engine of fermentation. So this is the microorganism that actually creates the alcohol in sake. And if you know anything about wine or beer, uh, the yeast that we use in sake is similar in that it eats sugar and gives off alcohol and CO2. So it has that very simple role to uh, create the alcohol, and it also gives off aromat aromatic compounds and some acids as well. So that has a big influence on the aromatics of the sake. The next ingredient may be the least familiar to people who live outside of Japan, and this is koji mold. So koji mold is used in making sake, and sometimes people freak out when they learn that there's mold in sake. But 
this is a friendly, delicious mold. Well, what do we do with this mold and why do we use it? Well, what we do with this mold is we take this green powder, this green mold, and we sprinkle it onto sake rice and we actually grow or propagate the mold onto the sake rice. This molded rice goes into the fermentation mash and it gives off an enzyme, that's the key. We get an enzyme off of this mold and that enzyme breaks down starch into sugar. So this is how we get glucose or sugar out of the starches that are in rice. If we didn't have this koji mold giving us that enzyme, then we wouldn't be able to get sugar out of the rice starch. So it's a very, very important part of sake production. Here's a picture of the, here's a picture of the mold spores being sprinkled onto the rice. And I wanna show you a picture of what koji looks like up close. Because when you say molded rice, you know, it's a little, if you haven't seen it before, it's a little hard to picture what it actually looks like. So uh, we grow the mold in, the, in this room, it's called the koji room. Uh, we grow the mold for about 48 hours. And we start off with sake rice here. Uh, the mold gets sprinkled. After 24 hours, we have something that looks like this. You can see the little fuzzy bits starting to grow on the rice grain. And after 48 hours, this is the finished product. So this is what uh, koji mold growth can look like on the rice grain. And again, this molded rice is put into the mash along with regular rice, regular sake rice, and that koji rice breaks down starch into sugar. That's the purpose of this molded rice, all right? And the final ingredient quickly is sake rice. So the one thing you need to know is that sake rice and eating rice are different. The structure of the grain is actually different. If we look at sake rice up close, you can see there's this little opaque center in the middle. That is called the shinpaku. It's the starchy core of the rice grain. The Japanese call it the white heart. It is the center of the rice grain where the majority of the starch is concentrated. If you look at a grain of eating rice, the starches are more equally distributed throughout the grain. But sake rice has a very distinct starchy core in the center. And this is really important. This structure is unique to sake rice, and it allows us to mill or polish the sake rice to isolate that starch. So the outer layers of the rice grain contain the fats and the proteins and the vitamins. That's actually the more nutritious part of the rice grain. But we wanna to get to the starch in the center, isolate that starch, and then we can use the koji, that mold with the enzyme, to break down starches into sugar. So uh, this very unique structure to sake rice is what makes it different from eating rice. And as a final uh, introduction to sake that I think we need to talk about briefly before we move on to uh, the tasting or anything else is um, the sake classification. So I just wanna take a couple minutes and review sake classifications. I'm gonna show you a special classification chart and here we go. So uh, this chart shows you the six main premium sake classifications. The first thing you need to know is that across the top of the chart, the top row shows you the rice grain going from 100% grain and then being milled. And the more you mill away, the smaller the rice grain gets. You can have 90% remaining, 60% remaining, 30% remaining. As you mill more and more of the rice grain away, you isolate more starch. This creates a sake that can have uh, unique, very fruity flavors, very elegant flavors. But as you mill down, this will also increase the cost of the sake as well. So the first thing a brewer decides when they make, when they make a sake is how much am I gonna polish my rice? So that's the first variable in the classification system. The next variable is just simply the ingredients. So we talked about four ingredients already, right? Rice, water, yeast, then koji, those four ingredients. If you make a sake with only those four ingredients and nothing else, uh, you have what's called a pure rice style sake. And that's indicated by the center section of the chart. You see on the left, it says pure rice style. And the pure rice style has three grades, junmai, junmai ginjo, and junmai daiginjo. The word junmai is very important. This literally means pure rice in Japanese. 
So if you see this word Junmai anywhere on your sake description or classification name, you know that it's the pure rice style. You know what the ingredients are. So to sell your sake as a Junmai grade, there's no milling requirement. You just need those four ingredients and nothing else, no additives of any kind. Moving up one level, Junmai Ginjo, this requires the rice to be milled to 60% or less remaining. And then moving up to the super premium level, Junmai Dai Ginjo, this requires the rice to be milled to 50% or less remaining. But as you can see, as you go up the classification chart, the rice grain generally gets smaller, the sakes get more elegant, they can get smoother in texture, and they can also get more expensive. And down at the bottom section of the chart, we have an area called the alcohol added style. So there is another type of sake where we add a small amount of distilled alcohol. So we have our four ingredients, rice, water, yeast, and koji, and we add a small amount of distilled alcohol. Um, the, at the very bottom of the chart, you see a category called futsushu. Futsu means ordinary or regular. So this would be non-premium table sake. Generally, this has a fair amount of alcohol added. It's fortified style. Moving up to Honjozo, that's when we get into premium sake for this alcohol added style. Honjozo requires 70% or less remaining. And the next two are easy to remember. We just leave off the word Junmai. So we have Ginjo, 60% or less remaining. And then we have our super premium Dai Ginjo, 50% or less remaining. So these, uh, from Honjozo up, these are our six premium sake classifications. And understanding what these mean and how we arrived at these classifications, I think is really important when we get on to our tasting. So if you have any additional questions about this classification system, uh, please let me know in the Q&A box and I'll be sure to answer your questions when we get to the Q&A portion. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to take a little tour. We're gonna to do a virtual tour of Niigata. I'm gonna show you the five breweries that we're tasting today. And uh, if you have any of the sakes that were on the Niigata sake list for this uh, seminar, please let me know in the chat which ones you have. Or if you're drinking another sake from Niigata, please let me know. I'd love to see what you all are sipping on at home. And I'm going to be introducing uh, five of the uh, wonderful Niigata sakes to you. And we're going to start in the northernmost part of Niigata and work our way south. So the first brewery we're going to look at is from a town called Murakami. Uh, so this is north of Niigata City, and it's on the Sea of Japan. And this is the northernmost brewery that we'll be tasting today. Um, some of the things that are famous in Murakami City are there's a very beautiful uh, castle ruins. Uh, Murakami Castle is very well known in that region. Uh, this region is also well known for salmon. So uh, one of my absolute favorite fish. Uh, salmon cuisine and salmon culture is very, salmon fishing is very popular in this region. And a lot of people dry salmon in this region as well. And there's a, a craft called kibori tsuishu, which is a very delicate carving of wood for different decorative boxes and trays that then gets covered with lacquer. And you, in the picture, you can see just a hint of what that's like. Um, I checked out some pictures online and it's really beautiful craft uh, that is uh, based in the Murakami region. So the brewery that we're visiting in Murakami is Miao Shuzo. They make a brand called Shime Haritsuru. Shime Haritsuru. And this brewery was founded in 1819. 1819. So 200 years ago. Let's take a look at the sake we're going to be tasting from this brewery. So this is the Shime Haritsuru Jun Junmai Ginjo. I've got it right here. This has a 50% rice milling. The SMV, that uh, sake meter value, how sweet or dry a sake is, plus two. So plus numbers tend to be drier, negative numbers tend to be sweeter. Um, and the sake rice for this is, guess what? It's Gohyaku Mangoku. Again, that native, very regional sake rice. So I'm gonna go ahead and pour this 
June my Ginjo, and it it's called June, J U N. And if you remember what June Mai means, June means pure rice. June Mai means pure rice. So June means pure. So that's the name for this sake. I'm gonna give it a smell. Mmm, it has a very, very lovely light flavor. I get a little bit of melon, a little bit of a fruit, and a hint of rice as well, but light and airy, not rich, not heavy. Mmm, very clean flavor, crisp on the finish. Really, really nice Junmai Ginjo, super food friendly. It's that type of sake that has a dry finish and just a hint of acidity, and it just leaves you salivating a little bit and wanting the next sip. Really clean, uh, very gentle. Uh, again, a little bit of fruit and aromatics in the nose, uh, but very clean, light, and a wonderful dry finish. Absolutely delicious. So if anybody has the Shime Haritsuru Junmai Ginjo at home, please let me know in the chat what you think about this sake. And if you're tasting along with me, uh, let me know what you, uh, what you think of this, if you agree with my tasting note. Um, it's very, very delicious. And uh, I would pair this very easily with sashimi. Um, I'm thinking of golden eye snapper, which is my favorite. I'm always thinking of golden eye snapper, but in particular with this sake, Wonderful sashimi dish would be perfect with this dry, clean, and light. Just cleanse your palate and uh, very, very delicious. Again, that's shime haritsuru. All right. Are we ready to move on to our next brewery? Let's see. <clears throat> All right. So we're moving on to Shibata City. And Shibata is just a bit south of. Murakami, and located a little bit closer to the capital of Niigata. And let's see what we have in Shibata. Shibata is famous for a few things. There is a castle which is not in ruins. Uh, Shibata Castle has been partially reconstructed. And this is just one little section of the castle, which is a little bit larger and beautiful. Shibata is also famous for its onsen, its hot springs. And there's a beautiful garden in Shibata, uh, Shimizu-en Garden. Uh, here you can see the fall view of the garden. It's absolutely beautiful. So this is a very picturesque, a very beautiful part of Japan. And the brewery we're visiting in Shibata is Kikusui. Uh, Kikusui Brewery, uh, they make a brand called Kikusui. And let's see which grade and classification we have for our Kikusui selection. Oh, this brewery was founded in 1881. Okay. All right, so we are drinking Kikusui Sakamai Junmai Dai Ginjo. So remember, Junmai Dai Ginjo was our super premium grade. The rice has to be milled to 50% or less remaining. And we see here that the Kikusui Junmai Dai Ginjo is milled to 40% remaining. So that means 60% of the grain is removed, only 40% remaining. That gets us in super premium territory. So let's give this a taste. And let me pour myself a taste of this beautiful kikusui. All right. Mm. Now this aroma also has some fruitiness to it, but it's a little bit richer than the shime haritsuru. That one was a little bit more lighter and more restrained. This one's a little bit more richer and maybe even a little jammy. Very, very uh, lovely, um, a velvety aroma. Gentle fruits. I don't get much rice or any lactic character, so this is more of a fruity but a rich aroma. Mmm. This has a very luxurious feel to it. A lot of richness on the palate. Uh, the finish lingers a little bit, so it's not quite as dry on the finish as the previous one, but uh, really rich, uh, really coats your palate. Uh, lovely, lovely velvety in texture. That's the word I've been looking for, velvety in texture. Uh, silky and 
these types of textures, when it's very velvety, very silky, super smooth, uh, these can be achieved when you've milled away a lot of the fats and proteins and you've isolated more and more of that starch. Um, the smaller you mill the rice, the more starch you isolate. And you can create these very elegant expressions of sake. And this is a great example of that. Um, and the, the sake rice used here, this is really interesting. So we have uh, this uh, kikusui, Junmai Dai Ginjo. And the sake rice used for this particular sake is also called kikusui. So there's a sake rice called kikusui. And wouldn't you know that kikusui sake rice is one of the parents of gohyaku mangoku. So that sake rice that we have come to recognize as native to, Ni uh, native to Niigata, as one of the regional uh, aspects of sake rice in Niigata, comes to be identified with Niigata. This is the parent. Uh, so the kikusui sake rice was um, blended with Shin 200 Go, Shin Nihaku Go, and those two together created Gohyaku Mangoku. All right, so we have a wonderful connection between the previous sake and this sake. Uh, so it's a rice that you don't see very often, but uh, Kikusui revived this Kikusui rice. And again, it's a parent of Gohyaku Mangoku, so I think that's really cool. All right, where are we headed next on our journey through Niigata? All right, so next we're going to Agamachi. We're going a little bit more inland away from the Sea of Japan. And we're gonna visit this town. And one uh, major thing that you'll see in this region is Kiranzan Mountain. So Kiranzan Mountain is one of the major mountains in the region near Agamachi. The brewery that we're gonna be talking about is Kaetsu, and their brand is called Kirin, and that's named after the mountain. So Kaetsu is the brewery name. And uh, the sake that we have from Kaetsu is uh, Tokubetsu Junmai Koshino Takumi. So that is the type of sake. This is a Tokubetsu Junmai. So you all learned what a Junmai was, but what's this Tokubetsu part? The word Tokubetsu means special. And it can be applied to any type of sake, any grade of sake, as an indicator that the brewer's done something special or unique to that batch. And in the majority of cases, the rice has been polished to a smaller size than you might expect for a given grade. So the milling rate here is 55% remaining. And Junmai has no milling requirement, so it could be 70 remaining, 80 remaining, 65 remaining, but they go all the way down to 55. So that's why this is considered the special or the tokubetsu junmai. Now the rice for this is gohyaku mangoku. We all know that by now. And I'm gonna pour myself a taste of this Kirin tokubetsu junmai. All right, now, on the nose, I'm getting a little mushroom, a little bit of earthiness. And I read online that this sake uh, is actually blended with a Yamahai sake. Uh, so Yamahai is a type of sake that produces earthier, uh, more umami-driven types of sake. And this, I heard this was a blend. And uh, you're really getting that very earthy, mushroomy, definitely umami notes on the aroma. I'm going to give it a taste. Mmm, very deep umami flavor, really delicious. You know, some sakes that are just a little bit earthy and a little umami can be too heavy, but this has a lightness about it. It's really well integrated. The earthiness, the little bit of umami. Mmm. If I had like a nabe or a hot pot with uh, shiitake mushrooms in it, it just popped into my head, like that would be the perfect pairing with this sake. Really delicious but definitely on the earthier, very umami-driven side, but again, a very well-integrated umami, uh, very, very balanced and delicious. All right, so our next stop on our travels, where are we going next? 
we are going to Nagaoka, Japan. All right, so Nagaoka is right in the middle of Niigata Prefecture, very, very centrally located in the prefecture. And we have a few highlights from Nagaoka. One is that fireworks festival I told you about. You can see in the picture there, it's insane, it's crazy. Uh, there are, there's a bridge that they shoot fireworks off this entire length of this long bridge. It, it was absolutely mind-blowing. So if you have a chance to visit, that's definitely worth it. Um, the uh, most prominent mountain in Nagaoka is Yahiko Mountain. And there's a beautiful park, uh, Echigo Hillside Park, that's also in Nagaoka. Uh, so lots of nature and a wonderful fireworks festival. I think that's one of the main reasons people in Japan might have heard of Nagaoka is because of the fireworks festival. So the brewery we're visiting in Nagaoka is Asahi Shuzo, and they make a brand called Kubota. Kubota was established in 1830, so quite a long time ago. And let's see which sake we're going to be tasting from Kubota. All right, we have their Senju Ginjo. So if we think back to our chart, Ginjo is the alcohol added style, and it was that middle grade of premium. So the milling rate here, it says 50 slash 55. So there's two milling rates, um, one for the rice used to make the koji, so that molded koji rice is milled to 50%. And the kakemai, or the rice used as the starch component in the mash, that's milled to 55%. And again, this is an alcohol added style. And does anyone wanna take a guess at what the sake rice is for this? It's not a trick question. This is a gohyaku mangoku. All right. So let's take a sniff of this aroma. Oh, very light, very, very light, super clean. Just a little wisp of aroma, so very, very light. Uh, the Niigata, the general Niigata brewing style is called Tanre Karakuchi, which kind of means clean and dry, clean and crisp and dry. And uh, the overall profile, if you think of Niigata as a general style, is this Tanre Karakuchi, clean and crisp. And I think that in this aroma really comes across, the aroma is super restrained and light, and that is very indicative of the regional style of Niigata. The aroma that is there is like a very, very gentle hint of fruit. Like if you had been cutting strawberries on a cutting board and you took the strawberries away and there was a little strawberry juice left on the cutting board and you smelled that cutting board, that would be like, oh, strawberries were here. That's kind of the aroma I'm getting, a little bit of strawberry, a little bit of melon, just a hint, a wisp of that. Really, really fun and really delicious. So let's give it a taste. Mm. So the aroma is super restrained. There's a bit more weight on the palate, but again, a dry finish. A really good balance. And um, this has an SMV of plus five. So that is a touch more on the drier side. Again, higher is drier with this SMV number. Um, so really good balance. And there is also a note of uh, umami, a little bit of rice flavor, and uh, coats the palate just a little bit. That added alcohol can coat the palate and create rounder textures when you sip on an alcohol added sake. And we have a ginjo here. So this sake is very delicious. It has really good structure um, on the palate, super restrained aromatics and a dry food friendly finish. So really, really delicious. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our final brewery and let's see where we're going. We are going to Minami Uonuma. So full disclosure, this is where I lived when I was in Niigata. So I know this region of Niigata uh, pretty much the best from having lived there for a year. Um, Niigata is really, sorry, uh, Minami Onuma is really the center of this Yukiguni or snow country. And here you can see some of the snow banks being plowed with these super powerful snow blowers. Uh, Minami Onuma is also a center, a hub for that Koshi Hikari rice that I talked about. And on the bottom right, you see the most prominent mountain in this area is the Hakaisan Mountain. And that gives us the name of the brewery we're visiting. Uh, this is Hakai Jozo, and they make a brand called Hakaisan Brewery. 
Uh, this brewery is the youngest of all the breweries we're tasting today. This was founded in 1922, and the current president is only the third generation president. So the sake we're gonna be tasting from Hakkaisan is the Hakkaisan Tokubetsu Honjozo. So we talked a moment ago with the Kirin sake, we talked about the meaning of Tokubetsu. Again, it means special. And this is a Honjozo. So again, no Junmai anywhere to be seen. This is our alcohol added. And it's called Tokubetsu Honjozo. So that means something special was done to this sake um, during brewing. And if we look at the milling rate here, again, 55%. So if you remember the chart, Honjozo has to be 70 or less. And this goes all the way down to 55. So that is a very special treatment of the rice for milling. So that's why this gets called a Tokubetsu Honjozo. So I'm going to uh, give this a pour and we're gonna examine this Hakkaisan Tokubetsu Honjozo. So again, this has a very light, light aroma, but I'm getting uh, rice notes, a little bit of a, just a very, very little uh, bit of a lactic character. That's like a creamy or a yogurt uh, a note in there, but very restrained, uh, restrained elegance, just really light and clean. Gentle riciness with just a hint of lactic. And then I'm gonna give it a taste. Mm. So this sake is dry, very, very smooth, um, food-friendly style. So this one is also alcohol added, so I'm getting a bit of that coating on my palate. The added alcohol can make sakes taste rounder and a bit more grippy on the palate, and I'm definitely getting that here. Wonderful dry finish, and the finish disappears very quickly. So uh, you get a wonderful uh, light rice, just a hint of umami, nothing bold or earthy, very light, but you're left with the sensation of dry cleanness on your palate. So it really is a palate cleansing sake. Uh, so that is our Hakkaisan uh, Tokubetsu Honjozo. All right, well, we have made our round trip around Niigata. I hope that was interesting to visit a few cities, see a little bit of the city and taste one of the sakes from there. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q&A section now. So I'm going to uh, see if we have any questions here. All right. So I'm going to put up our final slide, but we still have a few minutes to go. Um, so let's see. Here we go for the Q&A. Looking at the bottle, how do you know if it's a pure rice style or not, assuming that you don't read Japanese? That's a great question. Well, if you are in the States and you pick up a bottle like this, and it's all Japanese on the front, you have to turn the bottle around and there's a back label in English. 99 times out of 100, this will say what grade it is as well. So if you look here, this one says Hakkaisan Tokubetsu Honjozo right there. And these uh, this one says Kubota Senju Ginjo. So you see right here, this classification name we're talking about is very often right on the back label. So don't worry if you pick up the bottle and you, you can't read much of the front label. Turn it around and look at that back label and that will give you the information you need. Okay, here's another question. How long is the period for sake rice to grow before harvest? That's a great question. So growing sake rice happens the same time every year. Um, planting is usually in April or so, and harvest is always in September. So for those summer months from April to September, uh, the end of September, that is when uh, the sake rice is grown every year. And October 1st is an important day for all us sake people. October 1st is International Sake Day, and that is the official start of the sake brewing season. So generally, you can imagine rice harvesting happening throughout the month of September. And then when you get to October, brewers are ready to go. And starting October 1st, uh, that is the official kickoff for sake brewing, International Sake Day. All right. Do brewers, oh, let's see. Do brewers ever talk about how climate change is affecting Niigata? With winters getting pushed 
and the hotter season being longer? Is it affecting the amount of snow they can get? Well, this is a very, um, pardon the pun, this is a very hot topic right now, a very uh, important topic for the brewers of Niigata and for brewers across all of Japan. One thing that I've heard brewers talking about is where certain sake rices can grow. So Niigata has been a sweet spot for Gohyaku Mangoku, and Hokkaido in the far north has not had as much sake rice grown there. But as the climate slowly changes, they've noticed that you can grow certain sake rices a little bit farther north. Uh, so honestly, what the future holds, we really don't know, uh, but they are paying very close attention to this issue and climate change is something that will affect not only the sake industry in Japan, uh, but all uh, industries in Japan. So uh, they're keeping a very close eye on it. And uh, I hope that we can continue to make beautiful sake in Japan, uh, even if we do have a bit of climate change. All right, moving on. Uh, are these courses offered in English? I assume we're talking about the Sake School of America courses. Yes, we offer them in English. Uh, so uh, there is a, a class calendar uh, you see on the slide here, sakeschoolofamerica.com. If you visit the website, there's a course calendar. Some classes are offered in Japanese, uh, the majority are offered in English, and there's a wide variety of classes to choose from. So please check out the website and you can get the sake classes there. All right. Let's see. So Junmai means pure rice style. If you see Junmai, you got it. Well, that's right. If you see the word Junmai, that means pure rice style. Could be Junmai, Junmai Ginjo, Junmai Dai Ginjo. If you see that word Junmai, you know what the ingredients are. You know you have a pure rice style. What is the effect of the added alcohol in terms of texture and alcohol levels? Great question, I love it. So when you add when you fortify sake, when you add a little bit of distilled alcohol, this creates silkier textures, rounder textures. The Junmai styles tend to be a little crisper, more pointed, and a little bit more ricey. But when you add the distilled alcohol, you can create softer edges, more round textures. And the second part of your question about how does it affect the alcohol level, a lot of people very logically assume when you add distilled alcohol to the fermentation mash, that the finished product is gonna have a higher alcohol percentage. But what they do to trick us all is that they add water at the time of bottling. So the alcohol level for a pure rice style and for the uh, alcohol added style can be the same level. That's because water gets added, pure brewing water gets added at the time of bottling to bring down the alcohol level generally to around 15%, that's the average. So um, the great question, but if you do have that alcohol added style, it's mostly there for texture, aroma, and mouthfeel, and not so much for the overall alcohol level. Okay. Okay, um, could you talk briefly about how one applies to an internship in Japan? Well, it's not easy to get a sake brewing internship in Japan. Um, I think the most important thing is to establish a relationship with a sake brewery. And um, I think if you go and knock on the door and say, please hire me, that, that doesn't work as well. But if you um, build up a relationship with a brewer, uh, maybe talk to the distributor here and try and get a connection and maybe visit them if you have a chance to go to Japan, uh, that would be a great first step in trying to get us get a uh, internship. Uh, usually, Internships start a little bit shorter, like you may get a couple days or a week or so. And then if you continue in the industry, you can maybe build that up to a longer time. Uh, but it does take a bit of work and uh, really takes a lot of dedication. So if you're up for that, I definitely recommend you try to work at a sake brewery in, in the future. It's a, it was a wonderful experience for me. I will never forget it. And we have time for one last question. Uh, how long does sake last once open? All right, well, that is a classic question. Um, once the bottle is open, a lot of people think they have to drink the sake right away, like immediately, but you actually have a longer amount of time than you might think. Uh, sake can last uh, several weeks. The more aromatic the sake is, the less true that is. So you want to uh, make sure that sakes that have very delicate aromas, you wanna drink those more quickly, or sakes that are unpasteurized, you wanna drink those more quickly. 
but sakes that are more dry, more full-bodied, more structured, those can last for several weeks with no problem. So I want to thank you all so much for attending our Niigata seminar. I hope it was fun to travel through the different parts of Niigata. And I want to call your attention to this final slide here. If you're interested in classes at the Sake School of America, please visit sakeschoolofamerica.com. Our next webinar is coming up on Thursday. It'll be Shochu Rocks. So there's an informational seminar about Shochu coming up on Thursday, June 18th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And if you'd like to contact me, my website is urbansake.com, and you can connect me on all the socials at, at urbansake. I want to thank you all so much for attending. It was an absolute joy, and I look forward to seeing you all in a future seminar. Thank you so much. <laughs>